All right, stats, so this is it. This is the final video where you'll get to hear all of the information that I'm about to present to you for the year. So we are going to review the different types of testing and confidence intervals that we've talked about since Chapter 8. So this is going back quite a ways. So mainly, things are going to fall into three categories of confidence intervals and testing. We have the ones for proportions, we have the ones for means, and then we have the ones for multiple outcomes beyond two. Those are our chi-squared ones. So when we tested a proportion, the first thing we did was the confidence interval. Now on the screen, what you see right now is the entire process for running the significance test. When you run the confidence interval, you only need to check the conditions. So if we're dealing with a proportion, a percentage, when we go to calculate a confidence interval, we need a simple random sample from a binomial population, meaning it can only be success or failure. We need the n times p null and n times, we called it f null. Sometimes it's called q null, and sometimes books like ours just put 1 minus p null. But we need the sample size times success and the sample size times failure to be at least 10, and we need the population to be 10 times larger than the sample size. If those things are true, we can run a confidence interval, we can conduct a significance test. Now, when it came down to testing and we had to state our hypotheses, we would state them using P. So P equals whatever, and that's typically our null hypothesis. For the first test, they only ever wrote everything out in words. But nonetheless, we write what we believe P to be, and that's what we're going to put equals. And then for our alternative, we had one of three options. Either P does not equal that value, is greater than that value, or it is less than that value. Not equal to is known as a two-sided test. Greater than or less than is known as a one-sided test. After writing your hypotheses, you would then compute your test statistic, which for these is a Z, and your p-value, which tells us how likely the event was to occur. After doing that, we would write our conclusion. If p was less than alpha, which is our level of significance, then we called that statistically significant. If our p-value was greater than alpha, then we would say that that was not statistically significant. When something is significant, you reject the null hypothesis. When something is not significant, you do not reject the null hypothesis. If you reject the null hypothesis, then you tell me that your evidence supports whichever alternative you ended up choosing. Not equal to, less than, greater than. If your result was not statistically significant, and then you said that you do not reject the null hypothesis, you simply tell me that there's not enough evidence to support whatever the alternative was. Now, sometimes we were given a hypothesized P. For example, if I'm flipping a coin, I hypothesize that it's going to land heads 50% of the time. That is what I get for my P null. But sometimes we will compare one proportion to another. That is where the confidence interval and significance tests for two proportions come into play. When you are doing these, you are simply checking the conditions with not one, but two samples, because you have to check them both. You need a random sample of one taken from a binomial population, then you need a second independent random sample taken from another binomial population. Because you're actually gathering two samples, when you check the next condition, you only need to make sure that it's at least five. n1 times p hat 1, n1 times f hat or q hat or 1 minus p hat 1, uh, n2 times p hat 2, and n2 times f hat 2 are all greater than five. Both populations should be ten times larger than their sample sizes. Now, for this one, you'll see that they actually have the symbols in there. So for step two, I like the middle row, P1 equals P2, where you simply tell me which one is your P1 and which one is your P2.
And then for the alternative, that means I would also like the second one uh, or the um, top one because I like to either put not equal to or greater than because anytime I assign my proportions, I typically assign the larger proportion to P1. But it really comes down to your personal preference. You can technically assign the first thing they state to P1, the second thing they state to P2, and then if you're testing to see if the first thing was smaller than the second thing, you might have the third row down for your alternative of P1 less than P2. However, you'll notice I chopped off the rest of it because the rest of it is the same. Your test statistic is still a Z, your p-value is still going to be compared to your alpha level, and that'll determine whether things either are or are not statistically significant. The conclusions are quite similar, even though instead of comparing it to what you thought was a proportion, you're comparing one to the other. Does your evidence support that they are equal? Does your evidence support that one is either not equal to the other, or maybe one is larger than the other? That's a two proportion. Now we also learned about are types of errors when we first talked about testing. Type 1 error is when you reject something that in fact was true. That's not good. You don't want to reject something if it's true. Type 2 error is when you don't reject something that's false. Obviously if something is false you're hoping to reject it but maybe you don't. Power of a test, you'll notice that they define it as the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis, but for most of you guys, I found it easier to explain power is anything that causes a confidence interval to get narrower, more precise. Increasing a sample size, that's going to increase power. Decreasing your confidence actually increases power. Now, of course, that one isn't always a great thing to do, which is why if it's possible to increase the sample size, that's the method you really want to take. After talking about proportions, the next thing we focused on were means. And we're a lot more familiar with averages, typically, than we are just basic proportions. If my goal is to test and see if something has an average that I think it has, then I might be doing a significance test for a mean. Doesn't matter if I'm running a confidence interval or a test, I still have to check the conditions. Was it a random sample? If it's an experiment, did they randomly assign the treatments? I also have to check and see if the distribution is normal. Now remember, this is where we first learned about the actual 1540 guideline, which said that if a sample is at least 15, but maybe not over 40, it doesn't have to look perfectly normal, but it shouldn't look extremely skewed or have any extreme outliers. And we also learned that if the sample was at least 40 in size, then we really didn't care if the distribution wasn't normal. This will still end up giving us very accurate results. But in the case of samples of less than 15, we had to make sure that they were mostly normal to begin with. You still have making sure that the sample size is 10 times smaller than the population, just like you do with proportions. For this one, rather than using P, we use a symbol called mu. So mu equals whatever we hypothesize. Maybe I think that the average GPA at Clinton Massey is about 2.8. That would be my mu null. And then I could get a sample and compare whatever my sample result is to that hypothesized value to see if I'm right. The alternative, just like with a proportion, could be not equal to, less than, or greater than. When you go to calculate your test statistic rather than a Z, you'll be using a test statistic called T. They have similar properties as the sample size gets larger, but for the most part, you just need to know that the calculator is going to figure out where the T is and isn't significant. Because unlike a Z, which we kind of already have definite boundaries, the T changes depending on how big your sample size is. And we still get a p-value, which will be analyzed exactly the same way as it was with Z. You'll want to make sure that you continue to write your conclusions in the context of the problem, making sure that you state that it's the average you're talking about and not the percentage, 
because now you're working with a mean. Now, just like with a proportion, sometimes you don't know what the average is, but you want to compare an average in one thing to the average in another. That's going to be a significance test for the difference between two means. So for this, it's almost the same thing, you except you're going to have multiple samples, they both need to be random, and they also need to be independent. You have to check that both samples are approximately normal, or that they meet their 1540 guideline. And again, both samples should be 10 times smaller than the respective populations. When you go to state your hypotheses, you're typically going to write mu1 equals mu2. It's not a whole lot different than p1 equals p2. You tell me which mean is mu1 and which mean is mu2. I typically like all the stuff on the left side when stating the hypotheses. You can technically use the stuff on the right side if you prefer. Keep in mind that if you're assigning which one is mu1 and which one is mu2, I have the luxury, just like I did with proportions, of always assigning the larger one to mu1 and the smaller one to mu2, which means typically I wouldn't see that second row used very often, because I would either be testing that they're different, which is mu1 not equal to mu2, or I would be testing that the first one is greater than the second one, mu1 greater than mu2. Doesn't matter that we're comparing two means, we're still going to get a test statistic t and a p-value just like we did with a single mean. Now the one that can get tricky is the paired observation. This is where you're going to find out that your two things are in fact not independent of each other, so rather than compare them directly, mu1 equals mu2, you'll take the difference between the two. The common example we talked about in this was heart rate data. People's heart rates simply are not one of those things that are completely and totally independent of the other factors in their lives. Certain people have different resting heart rates than other human beings, and therefore, the only way to really compare them is to either get data ahead of time so that you can put people with similar heart rates together, or you can do what's called a repeated measure, which is where you have every single item in your sample get both treatments in the case of an experiment, or receive both, I guess, survey question type things in the case of a survey. Whenever you do that, what you're going to do is you're going to take the results of the one and subtract the results of the other. When we did the heart rate data, we did standing versus sitting. We wanted to see if standing caused your resting heart rate to be higher than sitting. So, we first just tried to separate them into two groups by doing a mu1 equals mu2. The data was all over the place because of all the variation. We tried to eliminate that variation by pairing up people with similar heart rates. Then we had one of those people stand and the other person sit. But there was still just too much variation even trying to pair up similar people. But then with a repeated measure, we had one person stand, get the results, then have that same person sit and get those results, and then compare those two results. That eliminated the variation that a person would have between themselves and others, allowing us to combine the data. When you combine data because of the fact that they were not independent, then when you check your conditions, you're going to check that the combined data is approximately normal. After con uh, checking that the combined data is approximately normal, you're going to write your hypotheses using mu sub d, so the mean of a difference. And then you can test to see if it's zero, which means that basically the two things you were comparing are equal, or if you assign the larger value first, that the difference is greater than zero. You could technically have that middle one of less than zero, but you'd have to assign the smaller value uh, minus the bigger value. And typically when people subtract, they'd rather not work with negative values. You'll still get a test statistic, which is going to be t again, and you'll still get a p-value, which you'll use to determine if the difference was, in fact, statistically significant or not. Keep in mind, you should only be using these paired observations if the two pieces of information you're comparing are not independent of each other. All right, the rest of this stuff we should be pretty familiar with since we've now been remote learning this for the last couple of weeks. A goodness of fit test is whenever you have outcomes 
that are more than two. So typically you don't want to do these if there are only two outcomes, because if there were only two outcomes, you could run this as a proportion test instead. So if there's more than two outcomes, you're looking to make sure that, let's check the conditions, all of the outcomes fall into one and only one group, so no overlapping categories. For goodness of fit, you have to be given a model. They have to tell you what the breakdown is. It might be something simple, like if I'm rolling a die, I know that each outcome should occur one-sixth of the time, but if it's something more complicated, then I need to be given what the percentages or distribution is. I, of course, still need to make sure that my sample was selected at random, and the expected values should all be at least 5. For the null hypothesis, we typically just simply say that the distribution of outcomes is equal to whatever we expected. And for the alternative, we're going to say that in at least one of the outcomes, the thing was not met based on the model. So if I go back to the die as an example, I could say that the distribution of outcomes on the die is equal for all six sides. The alternative would be that for on at least one of the sides, the die is not landing one-sixth of the time. That would be my alternative. My test statistic is called a chi-square, so it looks like an x, the symbol is called chi, and it's to the second power square because these values are always positive. You're going to make sure that after you calculate your test statistic, you still get a p-value, and thankfully the p-value is exactly the same interpretation as every single other test. Now do keep in mind that chi-squared is the only one where you have to physically put in what's called the degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom is based on however many outcomes there are, minus one. So in the example of a die, since a die has six outcomes, you would have to do five degrees of freedom. This is literally the only test where you have to put in the degrees of freedom. So just make sure you remember it for these goodness of fit tests. For the chi-squared test of homogeneity, we are going to have a matrix of data because we're going to have two variables. That's important here. And because we're going to have two variables, that means we're going to test and see if the one variable has any association to the other. But it's a little bit different than our last test known as a test of independence. When we run homogeneity, we have to have independent, simple, random samples, that's plural, that are fixed in size. Notice it says they don't have to be equal, but you have to decide from the get-go how big each one is going to be. And again, it's multiple samples. That's really what gives this one away. Everything should fall into one category, so no overlapping. And the expected values should all be five. The good news is when you're getting the expected values for this test and for the test of independence, the calculator will actually get the expected values for you. For homogeneity, the hypotheses are a little trickier. You want to say that the distribution of values is the same for each, now notice it says population, but it's really for each item that you're comparing. Uh, the distribution of responses is the same for each year. If they give you a bunch of data for multiple years and they give you a bunch of people's responses to a question, you could simply tell me that the distribution of their answers is the same for each year. They're talking about populations as in the group of data that you're looking at, not really the population of human beings. For the alternative hypothesis, notice the first few words. Those are really important. In at least one of the things, the distribution is not equal to the other distributions. So again, if I asked a bunch of questions to people over the course of a five-year period, then maybe I run a test where I say the distribution of responses is the same for each year. That would be my null hypothesis. My alternative hypothesis would be in at least one of those years, the distribution of responses is different from the other years. Then you would type that information into a matrix. Keep in mind, you do not include the totals of however many things you sampled, only the responses themselves and then you run the data, you get your test statistic, you get your p-value, and you continue to analyze just as we have been. For the chi-squared test of independence, there's one major difference. You are not taking multiple fixed random samples. You're going to take one large 
simple random sample. Then, after taking that one large simple random sample, you're still going to make sure that all of the data was in uh, non-overlapping categories and that the expected values are at least five. Now, I know it looks like there's a lot of words here, but actually the hypotheses for these are the easiest of all of them. The null hypothesis is always going to be that one variable is independent of the other. For example, if I try to use that previous one that I just said, years and responses, let's say that I just asked a bunch of questions of people and I'm looking at responses and I didn't pay attention to when these questions were asked, I would just grab the data and then classify everybody based on when they answered the question and what their answers were. And if I do that, which would kind of be a weird thing to do, I could see if the year was independent of their responses. But it has to be gathered as one large sample. That's the key here. You're not gathering multiple random samples. So you just say that variable one is independent of variable two, and the alternative hypothesis is that the two variables are not independent. You'll plug it into the calculator the exact same way using matrices. You'll get a test statistic known as chi-square, and you'll get a p-value, which you will once again interpret just like we have every other p-value. The nice thing is whenever you get this p-value, the conclusion is almost built in for you. If it's significant, then you say evidence supports that these are not independent, and if you get something that's not significant, then you say evidence supports that these are, in fact, independent. Pretty simple. So anyway, guys, those are all of the different tests that we've talked about. I'm going to include with uh, the email update that I send you and the link to this video a practice set of problems for you to work on based on all the different types of tests. I don't want you to stress over the quantity. Obviously, it's going to seem like a lot, but that's mainly just so that you can see all the different types. I want you to ask your questions just like you normally would, and I will provide the answers to those questions uh, later in that week. Now, that being said, remember that for week six, you're going to have one big quiz, and that quiz is going to cover, let's just say, whatever I feel like it needs to cover to wrap things up for the year. So I don't want anybody to freak out about that. I don't want anybody to get anxious, all right? So let me just say that for week six, I can promise you that the things that I ask you to do for your quiz, you are more than capable of managing. So get the questions uh, turned in to me for this review by Sunday. So again, midnight Saturday is when you would want to get those turned in. They are not going to be graded for correctness in any way, shape, or form. All you have to do to get full credit for the week in week five is submit all the questions with proper answers and make sure that you submit them on time. So if they're submitted on time, you've answered them the way they're supposed to be answered. It doesn't matter if you get every single one of those wrong. You're still getting full credit for the week. Okay? So this is review. This is just making sure that we kind of summarize all the different types of uh, confidence intervals and tests we've gone over. Look for that email. And guys, I cannot thank you enough for what I still think has been a great year. I really wish we could have finished things up in the classroom. But overall, you guys were a great group of students. I really appreciate those of you that have taken the remote learning really seriously, asking me lots of great questions. Uh, I look forward to hopefully seeing you guys in the future. Never be afraid to contact me even after graduation. I will hopefully stay in contact with some of you guys for years to come. Thanks for all of your hard work this year, and I will talk to you guys again hopefully soon.